Hello, Altviz. I had planned to be there in person to present this essay, but unfortunately COVID had other plans for my family. In his 2016 essay collection, The Weird and the Eerie, the late writer Mark Fisher set out to define what these two terms mean. And he references a selection of critically notable films, novels, television series, and pieces of music that evoke the weird and the eerie. And his writing led to my own realization that data visualization might also be capable of instilling these unique affects. Fisher argues that the weird and the eerie are distinct from one another, even though they're often associated with genres of horror, science fiction, and especially post-apocalyptic speculative fiction. However, the weird and the eerie are not necessarily horrific or devastating. According to Fisher, the weird is that which does not belong. That is, the presence of something that seems wrong or at least strange. The placement of something unfamiliar within a familiar context. And it's not necessarily a negative affect. There can be enjoyment in seeking out the weird. Now, in contrast to the weird, Fisher defines the eerie as a reaction to situations when there is something present when there should be nothing, or when there is nothing present when there should be something. Now, in both of these cases, there's a question of agency, a question of who or what is responsible for the lack of absence or lack of presence, and what motivated or continues to motivate this unseen agent. Now, in my essay, I contextualize the weird and the eerie by discussing a few related affects in visualization and HCI research, and these include fear, thrill, uncertainty, ambiguity, doubt, uh, a profound feeling of loss, and even humor in some cases. Ultimately, if the affective goal of communicative visualization is persuading viewers to take action, in order to compel to action, you first require strengthening or changing the viewer's belief. Now, encountering the weird is an opportunity to change what one believes. And according to Fisher, the weird forces us to acknowledge that the weird thing is not wrong. It is our conceptions that must be inadequate. Another motivation for this essay stems from my interest in visualization techniques that integrate semantic cues into encodings of data. And while it might be easy to imagine semantic cues that indicate how a particular visual pattern is either good or bad or a, a, a thematic uh, sense of what the data is about, it is less clear how to effectively communicate that some visual patterns are simply weird or strange. Similarly, it's not universally obvious how visualization designers can, can communicate that a particular pattern is present or absent, as well as how to express a lack of explanation for these presences or absences. So what can be said about visualizing the weird? Visualization designer Andy Kirk remarked that people are naturally drawn to gaps and exceptions and things that don't really fit in with the rest. And yet designing representations of data that emphasize the weird can be a very fitly challenge. Now, real data sets often contain outliers, missing data, and often just weird distributions. And if you're a professional data analyst trained to spot these weird distributions, they might seem wrong or strange given the context, but how can that analyst then effectively communicate that these distributions are weird to a lay audience? Now, despite the precision and generalizability that scatter plots and their variations might offer using other forms of representations beyond scatter plots, according to Enrico Bertini and colleagues, can promote serendipitous discovery, educational impact, hedonic response, or changes in behavior. So like the hedonic enjoyment of the weird in popular culture, I believe it's similarly possible to enjoy weird visualization design choices. Now in other cases, weird choices of representation can accentuate weird patterns in data. Now consider the connected scatter plot, like this one. It can resemble a line chart, but can also exhibit visually prominent line reversals and loops like you see here, indicative of some weird events in the relationship between two variables over time. And if you don't have these weird events, a connected scatter plot is actually a poor choice for showing bivariate temporal relationships. The connected scatter plot is not alone in its capacity to draw attention to the weird. Visualization designer Martin Lambrex has amassed a catalog of techniques that he calls xenographics, which he defines as weird but sometimes useful charts. Now, the concept of xenographics suggests that given a weird observation in data, there may or should exist a suitably weird way to represent it. More on this in the essay. Now, Fisher's definition of the eerie as a failure of presence brought to mind Nicole Hengisbach and colleagues' review of the four types of missingness in data. Let's review. Now, if an entity exists in reality and is either completely or partially captured as data, the representation is complete, or at least partially complete. However, if that, if that entity is present in reality, but unaccounted for in the data, this is an absence, and the converse is an emptiness. 
Lastly, there's nothingness. Entities are neither present in reality or represented in the data. Now, given these categories of missingness, an absence or an emptiness could be seen as eerie if there's ambiguity with respect to the processes of data collection or data redaction, who was responsible, what their motivations were, and if any external forces acted to bring about these absences or emptinesses. Nothingness can also be eerie. Even when the processes of data collection are relatively transparent, and particularly in cases when something or anything was expected. Now, in communicative visualization design, evoking an eerie affect around absences in data requires establishing what expected patterns look like or how they have manifested in the past, contrasting presence with absence, or withholding or deferring possible explanations for this absence. So a really nice example of this formula is Isao Hashimoto's 1945 to 1998, which you see here. If you see this on YouTube, this is a multimodal combination of visualization and sonification, animating every atomic detonation during this time span on a world map, different colors and tones indicating the nations responsible for each detonation. Now, after several really cacophonous decades, hundreds of detonations and a barrage of color and sound, when you get to the late 90s, it's actually markedly quieter. A relatively eerie calm is set in by 1997, 1998. And by withholding any verbal or written explanation in the video, this accentuates that eerie affect. Now, an eerie affect induced by a failure of absence could arguably be triggered by uh, our propensity towards apophenia, which is a bias in which we recognize patterns and attribute their appearance to an entity or entities that have some agency. But in most cases, of course, there is no agent, and the pattern is fleeting, it's illusory, or just insignificant. Now, visualization designers have to exercise care so that their viewers don't succumb to apophenia unless this is the intent. So an example of this is the very funny Viz in the Wild project by Michael Brenner on Instagram, which uh, spurious visual patterns are captured in photographs and captioned as if they were charts. However, there's other cases where an explanation for signaling patterns, there is an explanation of these patterns when there is, were none expected or designed. Now, Dietmar Offenhuber's notion of autographic visualization is useful here, as the interpretation of material traces like this ice core trace uh, left by environmental phenomena can be often yield meaningful measurements, as well as revelations regarding the process of data generation. Now, meaningful measurements depend on several design operations in autographic visualization. This includes the juxtaposition of frames, annotation, and adding decoding scales along these material traces. And by undertaking these operations and measurements, practitioners can arrive at explanations for the patterns that they capture. And that might include an attribution of agency, such as air pollution caused by human industry or transportation, like you see here. Now, a sense of the eerie can be instantiated when an autographic visualization either fails to attribute this agency or fails to explain the motivations of an identifiable agent. So it's similarly eerie when an expected material trace vanishes and we are bereft of any explanation for this disappearance. So I'll offer a personal uh, example. For years, I, I visited this Florida beach and it was pockmarked with tiny holes made by sand fleas all along the beach, a, a visual pattern that was really distributed evenly along the shoreline. But one year, this pattern had vanished altogether along the stretch of the beach. And in that moment, I could not explain why suddenly there was this lifeless failure of presence. Of course, I would later learn that one of the adjacent resort hotels had began importing sand from elsewhere, destroying the natural habitat of the fleas and that visual pattern. So we are living in weird times. Uh, we have weird weather fluctuations, invasive species, algal blooms, disruptions to currencies, real estate markets, supply chains. But how we represent these and other weird happenings whenever we capture them as data should be commensurately weird, particularly if we're communicating just how weird they are. For example, there's new visual idioms like Ed Hawkins warming stripes, which are useful in communicating how weird extreme weather events are. Though even these elicit questions of how we should visualize future extreme values. We could keep renormalizing the color palettes to make deep blues or deep reds more apparent, but renormalization might fail to capture the severity of the next weird event. Our world is also increasingly eerie. Uh, writer Jenny O'Dell recently wrote about the feeling of living in apocalyptic times, which is fitting given how post-apocalyptic films and novels often evoke this sense of the eerie. 
Now, biodiversity loss has resulted in eerie landscapes and oceans. Human migration has resulted in eerily empty urban centers or empty rural settlements and conversely crowded interstitial spaces. So why are there absences in places where entities are expected, and present in places where they're not? Odell's writing also mentions that the etymology of apocalypse is Greek, uh, meaning to reveal, and that prior to its modern English usage signifying an ending, apocalypse was actually closer in meaning to insight. So given that old saying, the purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures, maybe there's some utility in thinking of the notion of ap apocalyptic data visualization. And in experiencing the eerie, each viewer can arrive at some degree of insight, that is to identify the forces acting on the world and the data collected. So in conclusion, for much of what could be constituted as weird or eerie in our world, we have the potential via data visualization to document this reality and ultimately the potential to change what our viewers believe. So I'll leave you with several design implications like you see here. There's more about them in the paper, uh, including some that I did not discuss in this talk. So please read the essay if you want to go further down this rabbit hole of the weird and the eerie. Thank you.